Peace and blessings. Welcome back to Sunday Night Prime with you here. Father Augustino, Father Innocent, and Brother Angelus. <laughs> what a blessing. Brothers, we get to serve the people of God in New York City. New York City <laughs> is a city filled with extremes. <laughs> And, and that's not an understatement by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but Aristotle, the eminent philosopher, said that in medio veritas, in the middle, there is virtue. He didn't say that because he didn't speak Latin. Uh, he said it in Greek. But in the middle is virtue. But let me tell you something. In the middle, if you walk down the middle of the road in Broadway in New York City, you're going to get problems. Uh, my brothers and sisters... Father Benedict has something to share about extremes. And there's a lot of extremes, right? Left, up, down, where do we go? Let's listen in. For years, we've had liberals and conservatives. And each one, each side, is blaming the other side for the trouble. And you have moderate liberals, moderate conservatives, and they get here, and further out, you get the radical liberals and the arch conservatives and you know it's a globe they go around the world and they meet each other at the other side if you went from new york to the west and to the east kept going you're going to meet in shanghai yeah. and that's what happened people with very strange beliefs ended up in the same spot for instance there are probably listening tonight some very arch-conservative Catholics who will only allow to have mass with a priest who was ordained before, uh, during the time of Pope Pius XII. There's hardly any priests left. I was Pope uh, ordained under uh, Pope John XXIII. So they wouldn't let me have mass. What happens to have mass without a priest? That's on the far right. On the far left, you get particularly women who want to be priests. And so they will not have mass with a man, with a priest. Maybe they have a, 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 someone who is pretending to be a priest, perhaps to himself. So there they're going to the left, and they're all meeting the arch conservatives and the radical liberals together at Shanghai. They're all having mass without a priest. They end up in the same place. It's kind of funny if you think about it. Uh, now, this has got to be over. Uh, people are going to have their own preferences uh, to the conservative or the liberal, as people say, to the left or to the right. But let's get together on the important things are the teaching of the Catholic Church based on the Gospels, the New Testament, the tradition of the Church, the teachings of the Church throughout the centuries. And it's not hard to find them out. Get a copy of the Catechism of the Catholic Church and it will give you page after page the scriptures, and many, many quotations from the teachings of the church over the centuries. The Catholic Church is not a fly by, die, die, fly by night. It's been there a long time. Now, I am filled with enthusiasm, optimism from Jersey City. Believe it or not, young people, intelligent, interesting, young adults, beginning at the age of 18 and going up to about the age of 30. Many of them college students or college graduates, but not all. They have an in intuitive belief in the Catholic faith, or perhaps if they are Protestants or Jews in their own denomination. But I meet them, and they are moved by, by faith. It's very, very interesting. And uh, I, I'm, if you ask some very zealous 
ministers, very dedicated rabbis, they're going to probably tell you the same thing. Someplace the Holy Spirit has put into the atmosphere on the part of young adults and older teenagers who want real religion. Now some are not interested at in all. That forget that's another group. But those who are interested do not want milk uh, milk sop. They're not something that's just here today and gone tomorrow. If they're going to give up part of their life, if they're going to behave themselves, particularly something like a priest or a religious giving up their whole life, they're not going to do this for a fly-by-night. And unfortunately, many religious orders are dying away, standing up. And if you look around, fervent religious orders of sisters, friars, brothers, priests that are fervent and young and dedicated, you're going to see. Well, praise God, brothers. It sounds to me like Father Benedict was saying, <clears throat> if you're going to make it, if you're going to do it, you better get the best ingredients. Huh? Don't, don't get any processed religion. <laughs> We want fresh, good, good ingredients makes good food. Mm. It's kind of like what I was hearing from this. But then on, 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 on either side, you have these extremes that kind of end up, end up falling uh, on, on, on either end of this. Uh, brothers, this is going on. Uh, and this is in families. Families have huge disagreements. Uh, some people think that, that, that the ones who are going to church are crazy. The people who are going to church <laughs> think the other people are crazy. And it's like, this is all happening. This is really real. Father Benedict said there's great signs of hope. What are the hope? What's the hope that you see? He's, I think he said the hope was in young people. <laughs> <laughs> and it, <laughs> to this side of the stage. No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, no, he, but he did say signs that good signs of hope are, are, in, are all around us. And he said young people particularly, but I think, I think which is really important when we have this ide like ideological kind of discussion is to go back to the basics of, of people want to find an identity. They want to they identify, identify their whole life to something or to someone. And so we've said it before on this show, and I, and I don't want to oversimplify, but I think when we get caught up in ideology, we, it's an identity crisis. Because we start making ideology what's external. We start making, like, putting the emphasis on what's external instead of what is, what is kind of the, the, at the core and the center of, at this, at, in this conversation of, 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 our, of our religion, of our, of our experience of faith. So when I meet young people nowadays, especially with people who are caught on the, on the extremes, they want to identify with something. They want, they want to like, they want to give their life for something. So, you know, like Father Benedict gave, gave good examples, but when we get stuck in what's not essential, then we start identifying with, with these, these things kind of on the outside, whether how we look, um, well, like the rubrics um, or, no, or no rubrics, um, rules or no rules. And we forget that it's about Christ. We, we forget it, it's about his presence. We forget that it's about this relationship with him who's at the center. And it gets lost if we don't keep that as a central identity of, of our life of faith. And so I just want to kind of, in, in, my, in, in, in my particular way of responding here, I just want to keep it, that's the starting place. And I think it gets a little distracting um, when we don't start with Christ and we, we, can, we can end up going to the extremes. I'm not quite sure labels are helpful. Um, on the right or the left, conservatives or liberals. Um, I, I like the people who kind of say I don't use those, those um, labels and that, uh, that I want to be Catholic. Um, I'm just throwing this out there. I think a lot of people are afraid of the middle um, because they think somehow the middle is some sort of compromise or that if I somehow am, am, don't identify as this radical someone on the right or who could be considered conservative, orthodox, or someone on the left who can maybe considered more contemporary or that somehow the middle is, is not uh, Christian or somehow the middle is, is, is a confusing place to be. Um, these are big questions and, and, and big, this is the big conversation. But what is concerning to me, and just to throw this out there, especially for our audience, is that we put ourselves on the, the, the fringe and we put ourselves on the extremes. Um, we actually become less Christian 
And, we, and because what we do is that we start to be critical of the other. And we start to, to look at the other inside of the church as, as not being as good or not being as a part of things. Um, and I think they, that's good to be aware of, is that the extremes are very, very dangerous. Um, and to be Catholic is to, to, to be in a place where I think that can bring us together. Mm. It reminds me of, uh, of a contest that G.K. Chesterton won. It was the, a publication in England that said, uh, asked for essays on what was wrong with the church and who could mm. say it more succinctly. And G.K. Chesterton won because he said it in one word, two words, I am. Uh, he said, I am what's wrong with the church. And when you have that perspective, it kind of like it breaks down the barriers of like, well, you're this, I'm that. And, and, we, and it's good to associate ourselves, to, to learn. Obviously, we want to learn with people. But when, when we are blaming everybody else for the problems, and I think that's, that's maybe something even more fundamental, even beyond just like conservative, liberal. If everybody else is at fault, then we need to check our hearts. Yeah. We need to ask, wait, hold on. What am I responsible for? I, I, I can pray. If something's going on that is out of my control, like I can pray. And prayer has the power to change history. Amen. Amen. Uh, Pope John Paul II, uh, our, our, the, the, our Lady of Fatima, 1917, nobody would have thought that in 1989, the Berlin Wall would have fallen down. And it is, I'm convinced, through the power of prayer. And so maybe some of these differences that are coming up, and there's a, there's a lot of, of bad things going on. You know, r radical Islam, terrorism, uh, the, the power, the place of prayer is, is, is um, we cannot replace it. Mm -hmm. And again, it's going back to what's essential. Prayer is most essential. And I think sometimes when we, when we get caught in the extremes or get caught in the kind of the externals, no matter where you're at, um, we, we, we forget to pray. We forget that, like, of the, again, the, the, the privileged space of our, of, our, of our, the gift of our baptism, the gift of our relationship with God is that we, that we, can, we encounter Him and that we, we, we are called to be men and women of prayer. And I think, I think that's, like, again, a danger is that instead of be, being most essential, we get distracted. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's, we, we, it's getting distraction or getting distracted with things that we think are good. Um, you know, like social justice, which is, I mean, it's, it's, it's a pillar of the church. But sometimes we get distracted by those things and we forget that we, it takes us away from this with the intimacy with Christ. Did you ever hear Father Benedict tell the story of when he was studying in Colombia? Uh, he had a professor who used to be a major in the Soviet army. And she was a tough psychologist. And uh, one of his colleagues, um, who was kind of atheist, commented on somebody, they were doing role play in, in, uh, in doing counseling. And this person that he was counseling expressed faith. And the student kind of like dismissed her faith. And then the, 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 the Russian professor said, oh, interesting, are you a theologian? Where did you study theology that you can comment with authority on religion? And then she said something so profound. She was an atheist. She said, there are only two types of religion, good and bad. Good religion leads you to love God. Bad religion leads you to hate God. And, and right there from the mouths of atheists, uh, Father Benedict shared that story a number of times to the brothers. And, and we hear sometimes these two extremes but, but to get to that good religion, where you have a vacuum, something else is going to fill it. And our society is so much a vacuum of so many things. And the human heart is longing for more. And more is on its way. Just like Father Benedict said, there's hope for the young people. My brothers and sisters, we are going to be back after a very quick break. And we're going to talk more about the incredible hope that Father Benedict and we as well see in the young people in the church today. We'll be right back.
Peace and blessings. Welcome back to Sunday Night Prime. There is hope for the church in this country. And we see it. I see it everywhere I go. Sometimes it might seem bleak, but let me tell you what. It is not. And Father Benedict shared how he was so enthused at seeing young people. 18 to 30. Maybe some of us aren't <laughs> hard aren't uh, in that category anymore, but even still, we see this hope rising all over the place. Father Innocent, you are in charge of a missionary program of young men in the South Bronx. What are some, some signs of hope that you see? Well, th these guys would appreciate that I'm gonna say this, but they're impressive guys. They, they're all guys in their 20s. And you know, I, I'm constantly moved by the fact that they have sacrificed one year or even two years to live in the South Bronx, to live with the homeless and to really to really consecrate their lives for two years to to really go on this journey to encounter God and encounter the poor. But they're doing it for the pay though, right? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. It, trust me, it's out of this world. Um, <laughs> but the the, the 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 idea is fathers that I'm constantly confronted by the fact that these guys could be doing anything. Yeah. They are so gifted. They're, some of them are geniuses. They, they have, a, I mean, they're, they have grad, I mean, two, one guy just got his doctorate. They have, they've been to grad school. And these guys could have a significant impact on kind of the American, you know, culture. But they've chosen to give their, give their lives up for one or two years at a time to pray and to live with the homeless. And these guys are living in a dynamic gospel life and they've given their hearts to it and you can tell. And these guys are moved by this experience. It's not, they're not just social workers. They're not just like volunteers that, that kind of do this on their own terms. They've sacrificed a lot and given up their lives to be there and every single day to see them pour themselves out. And this is, I think this is the beauty is that these men know what's essential. They want to, they, they tell me all the time, Father, we just want to pray and we want to love, we want to love the poor. Mm. Young people in their 20s. We, Father, we just want to pray and we want to love the poor. And when I see them do this, they have a daily holy hour, daily mass. You find them in chapel at all hours of the day, just wanting to be intimate with the Lord and to take that intimacy to other people. I mean, that's like, that fills me with hope. I mean, that's, that's our, the young church alive in, in, in the South Bronx. And this is happening right now? Right now. I, actually, I need to get home because they're probably <laughs> taking a break. But this is happening right now. But you see that that shatters barriers, that shatters the idea that, that the, the kids on the right or the left can't work together and can't, can't find a way to get outside of how people define us or people put in boxes. It's a perfect example. Catholic Underground, another example of it. We have a, a Eucharistic Holy Hour. Yeah, explain Catholic Underground. Yeah, we have a Eucharistic, the friars run a Eucharistic Holy Hour every month in the city, um, down, down in one of the churches in the city. And it's a place where, I believe it was your quote, where the, the church and culture unite and we have a beautiful Eucharistic Holy Hour where people can worship and adore the Lord, beautiful music run or played by the friars. And then, then some time to be together. Typically, a, a, a Catholic artist would come in and, and express using their gifts, mostly singing, but um, to, to unite kind of these two things that, that young people enjoy, that young people love. They, it's, it's amazing, Father. There's over probably between 900 and 1,000 young people there every month downtown. Wait, wait, wait. Can you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> Between 900 and 1,000 young people downtown New York City every month. Praying? Praying. Worship, I want to say worshiping. It's beautiful. The, at, at the end of the evening prayer, lights go out, and, and young people are worshiping God in the Blessed Sacrament. Is this in St. Louis? <laughs> Is this in the New Midwest? York Is this New York City. <laughs> New York City? And then the, the beauty of fellowship and the beauty of people using their gifts and, and having a lot of fun and, 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 and being together afterwards. And again, so you, you have, you have the, these, these things unite and, mm. and, and in the city, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And I want to say those 900 to 1,000 people are so different. Mm. We're not talking just like all cut one, from one cloth. We're talking about, again, a good example of the church coming together who, and, and putting aside a lot of maybe ideal, cultural, ideological differences and coming together and, and just doing what's essential, worshiping and being together. Like, I mean, it's a pretty amazing witness to, I think what, what Father Benedict is saying is that it's like to be, to be in the middle and to be, and to unite in the middle to, to, live, to live our Catholic life. I mean, I think that's it's just a great witness. And I've, I've spoken to some people who love to go to Catholic Underground, uh, especially for the confessions. Yeah. Uh, it's not like a, 
people need time sometimes in the confessional. And yes, normally confessional is just for mortal sin. Okay. We understand that. But in this day and age, it seems like, like somebody needs time to kind of like work through something. And that's not always possible in a parish uh, when there's a line of 15 people uh, and, and, and Mass is about to start. At Catholic Underground, there's about how many priests? A dozen, maybe? A dozen priests hearing confessions for... Hours. Hours, usually three to four hours. Uh, and I've seen people really become transformed from this. And they're young people, <laughs> young people. Well, I, I, I should say something. Uh, what I love about Catholic Underground is that it's a lot of young people, but everyone feels welcome, yeah. which is great. Yeah. And everyone feels young. And everyone <laughs> feels between 18 and 30 all over again. And there's joy and there's beauty. In my experience, um, I, I help out a number of initiatives. And it is so joyful to see the young people take what you've taught them and live it themselves. So as, as you brothers know, I, I work with something called Corazón Puro, which means pure heart. And I received a message from somebody who used to live in New York and is now in Monterey, Mexico. And they just had a retreat. And, and so she got together with a couple of other girls who were up here in New York and they formed their own group. And now they are going to schools, speaking in colleges, uh, speaking to their peers about not ideologies, but something very controversial. <laughs> chastity <laughs> oh my gosh i said that on air i said the i said chastity and they are on fire normal people beautiful people intelligent people wanting to 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 share this message of hope and it does bring hope mm -hmm. especially when you see the young people um another thing that brings hope that is uh come it comes up every two to three years is world youth day uh, how does this bring hope, not just to you, to me, how does something like World Youth Day bring hope to the world? Just to remind you that we were, at, that we were all three at World Youth Day in Canada, but we were in high school and you were, you were I was a friar. <laughs> I was a friar, first vows, first vows. Your, your experience hope in the church, especially when you're young, when you know you're not alone. And you know there's uh, thousands and if not millions and people all around the world living this faith. Uh, worshiping God and and realizing what it means to live your faith outside of yourself and serving the poor or whatever it might be, and so you gather at this group, at this huge event that's held every three or four years, and you realize that wow the church is a lot bigger than me, mm. and, and it, the, that that is when the church kind of busts outside of your expectations, and and of your what you think the church is and how you think things should be, but you experience. The church, the Holy Father, the beauty of, of being together, and it's more about, it's, it has to be more than about just what I think the church is. Hmm. And, and there's so many signs of hope. My brothers and sisters, there are a lot of divisions that exist among us. Uh, liberal, conservative, but Jesus Christ as the center is always the source of hope that springs eternal. We're so happy that you could join us here on Sunday Night Prime. We'll be right back next week. Please join us. Pray for us. We're going to pray for you. Many blessings to you. We'll see you next time.